We're going to read the Word of God together, carrying on our Genesis series, okay? All right, uh, Genesis 39, all right, uh, this, uh, this evening. We're going to stand and read the Word of God together aloud, okay? Because this is always our practice here in UMC, because we always stand, all right, in honor of God's Word as we read God's Word together, all right? Uh, just the first 10 verses of Genesis 39. Uh, together, church, let's go. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, was one of Pharaoh's officials. The captain of the guard bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph and he prospered and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time who put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master's withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Father, we ask, O oh God, you take this passage of Scripture and speak to us, challenge us, O oh God, I pray, and cause us to respond, O oh God, we ask in Jesus' wonderful name and God's wonderful people say, Amen. Amen. Will you take your seats? How many of you... You are tempted sometimes, tempted to compromise, to cheat, to lie, maybe even to compromise morally or sexually. How many of you, sometimes you face temptations like this? Can I see your hands? How many of you? Wow, so many of you. How many of you face temptations of many times? See your hands. Many, many times. Okay. How many of you all the time see your hands? All right. How many of you never at all? Can I see your hand? Okay, if any hand is up, you must be Jesus. No one else but Jesus, isn't it? Never tempted at all. This is just amazing, isn't it? But friends, you know, the Bible is very frank and very honest in sharing with us about life and living. And here the Bible, friends, focuses one example of what a man, eventually, as we all know, a great man of God, how a man could face temptation like this. In fact, friends, you know, just not one temptation as we will see, it comes more than once, isn't it? All right, in this example of Joseph that we are going through this evening together like this. In fact, friends, you know what? I also entitled this not only as you face temptation, but also, friends, the ecstasies and the agonies of Joseph. Friends, you know, Joseph was a young man, probably 17, 18 years old. How many of you along that, okay, that age group? Can I see your hands? Okay, there are several hands. All right, I know. All right. This young Joe, all right, faced with all kinds of problems and challenges in his own life as a young little man. Why? Because as a young little man, we find that, friends, Joseph was sold by his own brothers to the Ishmaelites, the Midianites, right, merchants. And eventually what happens is that he was, right, taken to Egypt like this. But friends, you know, even though he was sold off, this is what you and I must be reminded about in terms of the ecstasies and the agonies of Joseph. You and I need to be reminded, friends, firstly, of the whole area of God's sovereignty in the life of Joseph. In what manner we see God's sovereignty in it? Verse 1, let's read together again. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. See, Joseph was sold by his brothers, as I said, and taken to Egypt, sold as a slave. And we tend to think to ourselves, friends, that's the end of Joseph we're going to hear from. We tend to think that probably his father, Jacob, will never right, see his son anymore again, isn't it? That's the end of the story of the life of Joseph. And sometimes, you know, friends, we may feel like this as well. Sometimes we wonder to ourselves, 
Am I someone who is totally insignificant and unknown? Someone who is just caught up in a whole giant cockwheel of insignificance in life? And sometimes we just wonder, is there meaning? Is there purpose? All right? Is there all right, a direction for me in my life? Friends, you and I must be reminded again and again that God, friends, is in charge of the affairs of both men as well as nations. That you and I must believe that, friends, you know, God is sovereign right, in all that is taking place in this world. God is sovereign even in our lives. We may feel that we are an unknown quantity, as it were. But, friends, you and I must believe that God is in charge. God is in control. Can you get amen for that? And this is an account that we read, of, oh, friends, here in Jeremiah chapter 29 and in verse 11. A very familiar passage of Scripture. Why? Let me set the context of this passage of Scripture. Here in Jeremiah 29, friends, God's people, they have been taken as exiles, right, from Judah, from Israel. They were taken as exiles to Babylon. Why? Because we find that God's people have been defeated and taken really, friends, as aliens and foreigners into a foreign land, right there in Babylon. And so, friends, you know, there they were, right, total strangers in a foreign land. They are therefore without three important things in life that we all look for. They are without identity, without significance, without belonging. Who are we when we are now aliens in a foreign land? No, loss of a sense of identity. Not only significance in life, do I have worth and value or not? Is there meaning and worth in life for me? But third and flying friends, where do I belong? Where can I belong in a foreign land like this? Friends, you know, you and I must believe that God is in charge and control. Can I get a good amen for that? Even here in Malaysia, whatever is happening in our land, God is still in charge and control of Malaysia. Can I get a good amen for that, isn't it? Friends, you know, it's so important to see from God's perspective. Why? Because here in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, that oftentimes we quote and we claim this promise to ourselves. But let's read again together. Together, church, let's read. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, in the midst of a people that have lost their own land, they're exiled in a foreign nation. God breaks through and says, God says, for I know the plans I have for you. Plans to always prosper you and never harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, if we think Malaysia is bad, look at the people of Israel at that point of time. Isn't it? when they're without hope, without future, without our own land, without a sense of identity and belonging, right? And yet God breaks through to say, I know the plans I have for you. Plans never to harm you, but to prosper you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I think, friends, Malaysia is not as bad as Israel at that point of time. All those who agree say, so friends, you know, Malaysia got hope. Well. Isn't it? We must dare to believe God. Because God is in charge, isn't it? Not men in charge, not any political system. Don't believe in any political system. Don't believe in men. Don't believe whoever's in charge. You and I must believe God is in charge or God is going to control. Can he would amen for that? God is sovereign in the lives of Joseph, as you see. So as a slave to Egypt, is there hope in the future? Wait, see, friends, as we look through it all, how the whole history unravels in the process for all of us. And friends, from this moment onwards, to the end of Genesis, it is all about the life of one man, Joseph, like this. We see God is in charge, friends, even though Joseph has sold as a slave, and we tend to think, no hope, no future. But friends, you know, there in Egypt, you notice, know friends, Joseph prospered. Why? Because in verses 2 to 4, we see Joseph's prosperity in this manner. Let's read together. The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered, and he lived in the house of Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household and entrusted to his care everything he owned. Why did Joseph prosper? We're told here in verse 2, he prospered because the Lord was with him. Friends, you know, it is so critically important, isn't it, for you and I to know about the presence of God in our lives. Wherever we are, whatever we do, friends, the most important thing for you and I as Christians is the need for the presence of God. Because if God is not going to go with us, never step out in any situation, in any manner whatsoever. And so, friends, can I say, in the job we're going to apply, in the job we're going to apply, ask, Lord, will your presence go with me in that job? Because if God's presence is going to go with you, friends, for goodness sake, never apply at all.
In the course of studies, we're going to go into students as well. Pray, Lord, will your presence go with me in the area of studies, the course of studies I'm giving myself to? In anything and whatever it may be, friends, pray for God's presence because God's presence is most important, most powerful. Get a good amen for that. And it's because of God's presence, you see, friends, the hand of God is upon Joseph, even though he's a total stranger, all right, in a foreign land in Egypt. God bless him, God prospered him, and it's so very, very important. Now, sometimes we forget about the presence of God, isn't it? In whatever we do, whatever we say, in our behavior, even in our driving, sometimes we forgot God is there with us when God is there with us all the time. Can you, can you hear a good amen for that? I remember just recently I was driving out from here, Dream Center, out to the main road, trying to join the main road, out this road here, trying to join the main road there, center stage. And so long queue of cars ahead of me along the main road. And so I was just waiting, right, to be able to, okay, join the main road. Okay, and the cars were all passing by one by one, but they were inching very, very slowly. And then what happens is that I saw there's a gap. Why? Because this car came along a bit slower. So I thought there's a gap. So I thought I'll pick up speed and just join in, okay, so that I can move along with that. Just as I was going to go in, this other car that separated by a gap picked up speed not to give me the opportunity to join in the queue at all. You think that lady is a lady driver. How many of you think it's a lady driver? Can I see your hands? <laughs> How many of you think it's a male driver? See your hands. What kind of people are you? No decision, is it right? Okay, try again. How many of you think? How many of you think it's a male driver? See your hands. Let's be honest. See your hands. Okay. All right. Great. How many of you think it's a lady driver? See your hands. My goodness, church. You are really prejudiced against lady drivers, all of you. Okay? You need, you need a lot of prayer. Who is that person? Sadly, it's a lady driver. <laughs> and I have to hold my breath because I could have sinned against the Lord by what I say. Okay? I suddenly almost forgot the presence of God with me. You know what I mean? All right? Suddenly I realized, no, do you MC people? What do you do? In situations like this, you pray. Hello? I start praying for her, Lord. This lady needs a lot of prayer. A lot of lady drivers. No, no, not to know a lot of lady drivers. Okay, all drivers need a lot of prayers. Can we get amen for that? But friends, sometimes we forget, isn't it? The presence of God with us. Because friends, can I say, if we are conscious of the presence of God, we'll be very careful whatever we do, whatever we watch, whatever we say, wherever we are. If you and I are conscious of the presence of God, we become so much more careful in what we say, what we watch, what we okay, think about, where we go, who we hang up with, isn't it? It is many times, friends, when we forget about the presence of God, we do foolish things, silly things, and yet the fact of the matter is this, God is always with us, if you and I are God's children, all God's people say, because of the presence of God, when God is there, you and I, friends, when we honor God and His presence, He will be there to prosper us. He will be there to bless us. And this is what we see in the life of Joseph, that even Potiphar himself could recognize that Potiphar could recognize in his own house, he's been blessed. Why? He's been blessed all because of Joseph himself, as we read of, isn't it, early on like this. When his master, the third line, when his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, it was the master who noticed that Joseph had been so used by God and blessed by God that as a result, friends, when Joseph walked into the household of Potiphar, the grace and the blessings God flow into a household that doesn't know Jesus Christ at all. That's a reality, friends, for all of us, isn't it? And that's what, whatever we do, wherever we are, friends, it is so critically important to ensure that God's presence will go with us all the time. Can you good amen for that? Not only, friends, we find the third thing that you and I see is Joseph's prospect now in this case here. What is Joseph's prospect? Verses 6 and 7. Let's read together. So he, that is referring to Potiphar, left in Joseph's care everything he had. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said to him, Come to bed with me. What an opportunity. All quiet now. A 
a willing invitation. Nobody around the house. What's the problem? She wanted it. I don't mind it. Nobody around. What an opportunity, isn't it? My well, friends, here is Joseph. What didn't help for Joseph is that unfortunately he is tall, dark, and handsome. Isn't it? How many handsome people here? No, don't put up a hand. The master's wife took notice of Joseph. His friends already an opportunity seemingly in the minds of some people of a lifetime. And yet, friends, you know, what was Joseph's response? Before we talk about Joseph's response, you and I must know the temptations will come again and again in various forms and in all manner. Again and again. It wasn't a case of it just coming once when Mrs. Potiphar invited Joseph as well to bed with him. But friends, can I say, it is not just once. Look at verse 10. Let's read together again. And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go be, be with her or even be with her. It is day after day, friends. It is like a Cantonese serial on television. Day one, episode one, Mrs. Potiphar said, Layla. <laughs> and Joseph said, Moila. <laughs> Day two, episode two, Mrs. Potiphar said, Layla. Joseph said, Moila. <laughs> Day three, Mrs. Potiphar said, Mari, Mari, Mari. <laughs> chapat, chapat. Come quickly. Again and again. And friends, can I say, temptation many times. It is not just a one-night stand. It can come in various manners and forms. In our place of work, it's so common, isn't it? Sadly. And that's the reason why, friends, can I urge you, as I speak to you, I'm speaking to myself as well. It is so critically important to draw boundaries. To draw boundaries. And that's so important. That if you have to work constantly with a lady colleague as a man. Just be careful. Draw boundaries. If you sometimes at the work late into the night and just the two of you go for dinner together, come back, carry on your work, just watch out, be careful. Because if not, it will eat into each other's hearts. And before you realize it, something has happened. You know, friends, our body has got guitar strings. If it is strummed in the wrong way, it produces a lot of noise. But if it is strummed in the right way, it produces music and good music after a while. Are you still there with me? Hey, are you still there with me or not? Am I an alien talking to human beings here? Those are realities. Friends, can I say, it is not just for non-Christians. It includes equally Christians, even Christian workers. And that's why, for example, here in UMC, myself, together all our pastors, I don't allow us pastors to counsel a lady one-on-one. -on -one. Not permitted. At most, one time, first time, counsel, size of the situation, the problem, and then pass it on to another lady to counsel, even if it's a, if it's a lady need the help. And it's important, unless your wife is prepared to sit with you, you're not permitted to. Even for pastors, friends, the Bible says, never think of ourselves too highly, lest we fall. When we think of ourselves that this will not happen to us, we are already on a slippery slope down to problems, difficulties, if not disaster later on in life. And that's why the Bible is very frank and very honest. This morning, I just conducted a wedding. And many times I tell people, get married, you know what? Put your ring on. Men and women, put your ring on. Keep it on. All right, why? Because, okay, for us men, 
It is to remind us of a commitment we make to our wives and all those who agree, say, hey, not very committed, not very serious commitment. It is a reminder uh, to us of a commitment we make to our wives, isn't it? But not just that, friends. It is also to tell other people, you are no longer available. Hello? Are you still there with me? Am I talking to human beings with feelings? Of course, nowadays, sometimes, you know, you all ladies, you can wear three rings. Married men will still come for you, even if you are married. We are living in a crazy world. So if we don't draw clear boundaries, friends, we're inviting heartaches. We're inviting a trail of brokenness. And it results, friends, in dishonor and disrespect in a process like this. And it's so important, isn't it? Right? It will come in various manners and form. And before we realize it, we're entangled too late. And sometimes we call back home to our wife, sorry, darling, today a lot of work got to stay, long hours, okay? And next day, call back again, darling, a lot of work, okay, got to work late into hours. But actually what happens is that you're making quite rendezvous with a girl, okay? And you found that the girl loves to play tennis and you say, my tennis is not so bad, okay? And you go up to her and then teach her how to stroke that kind of thing and hold her hand before you realize, hey, friends, something has happened. And it's not uncommon to see this all over the world. So friends, can I plead with one another? Draw clear boundaries. All right. Be firm and steadfast. I'm so glad this lady working as an administrator in the office, when the boss came around, she handed the paper to him. All right. Instead of the boss taking hold of the paper, the boss hold her hand. She told the boss, I don't appreciate that, sir. Another example, at the end of the board meeting, after everybody has left, the boss told the secretary, help me to collect, put all these papers as people left. At the end, when it's just between him and her and the boss, the boss at the end, when nobody around, says, could you sit on my lap? Friends, can I say, I'm quoting real examples. All right? So that if we don't draw clear boundaries, it'll be such tragedy and disaster. Watch our hearts, guard ourselves carefully. It can come in various manner and form, friends, and that's so important for all of you. Can a good amen for that? Even giving lifts, for example, to the open sex sex. For me in UMC in particular, give lifts once okay, twice okay. After that, no more. Hello? Are you still there with me? Okay, isn't it? Because if you give lifts out of a good heart, you'll see someone working downtown Kuala Lumpur in a high rise, okay? And uh, same colleague, same office with you. And you notice in the process talking with her, right? She lives in the same housing estate here in PJ with you. And then on top of that, you find that what happens is that she goes uh, to office day by day by bus and you drive your car, you, all right? You've got sports spaces in your car and there's no one else with you when you drive down and you found out that she's a Christian and you're also a very wonderful Christian and out of the good, wonderful Christian heart, you offer her lips. Nothing wrong with that. But you do this enough times, things happen, unfortunately. That we begin to enjoy each other's company. Slowly, slowly, so tie happens. And before we realize it, heartaches, heartbreaks take place. Friends, for the Lord's sake, for God's community's sake, for our sakes, and for those who are married, for our family's sake, for our children's sake, let's draw this so that, friends, it will not create human tragedies and disasters in a process. Can I hear amen for that? And that's why, friends, the Bible is very honest. Comes like this. Frankly, honesty to Joseph. All right. I know the temptations will come. It will come in all forms and manner. And it will come again and again. And that's when you stand firm, resist against this, whatever comes along our way. Fourthly, what is Joseph's perspective? As much as we see God prospering Joseph, and there's a wonderful prospect open to Joseph, right? To do that, it is wrong. To commit adultery. With Potiphar, and moreover, he wasn't the one who engineered it. It was Mrs. Potiphar who engineered it. And nobody around in the house. So what's the problem? We may sometimes think, isn't it? 
But friends, that's the brilliance of Joseph, and that's why as a young man, probably 17, 18, 19, 20 years, just about that kind of age like this, look at Joseph, friends, what an amazing example he sets for all of us here in verse 9. Let's read together. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You see, friends, the amazing perspective of Joseph like this is how could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? In other words, friends, from Joseph's perspective, what happened, instead of seeing this as an opportunity, Joseph sees this as a great offense against God. The first offense is against God, not against even Mr. Potiphar or what, whoever around, friends. It is against God. Why? Because God sees, God knows. Can a good amen for that, isn't it? And that's what it is for all of us, friends. Okay, and that's why, friends, Joseph is so precious. All right? He's one of my heroes. Amazing, okay, isn't it? And Joseph has saved the lives of many people. This pastor was saying, he checked into the hotel, and then he came down for the evening meal, and then there was this lady walking up and said, the lady said, right, have a lovely meal, huh? Yeah, that's right, okay? And then the lady said, uh, uh, by the way, how is your room? He says, okay. And so this pastor thought, oh, this lady is someone working in a hotel, just, just concerned to make sure that he is uh, well taken care of, his room is okay, and he's happy in the hotel. And then she sits down and said, uh, uh, what kind of bed do you have? Do you have king-size bed or single beds? And then after some questions, the something happens in his mind. Just as he was trying to answer more questions, king size or single beds and so on and so forth, suddenly he saw little Joseph ran by boom. Joseph saved his life. Hello? Joseph can save our lives. Isn't it? Very important for all of us. For him, it is not just sin against men. It is not just offending Mr. Potiphar if he finds out. Most important is offending God. And you and I, friends, it's God's people, must always be aware He watches, isn't it? He watches. I'm very conscious. I pray by God's grace and church, thank you for your prayer. Because whenever I travel, I'm very conscious. The boundaries I need to draw, guards I need to make, and that kind of thing. Like this is important. And that's why I bring Doris along with me, okay, to help me along as well. That together we are committed to each other, isn't it? For one another's good. And that's so important for all of us, like this. And men who are sent to China to work, for example, I say to men, okay, if you're married, got a wife, quickly bring a wife along as soon as possible. Okay, as soon as possible. Go there, look for a house first. That's your top priority and bring your wife, bring your family along, that kind of thing. Don't go for three months and come back home. Your wife might not recognize you after that. Those are realities, friends. Give you another real example. This brother from DMC is working in China. There's a knock on the hotel door and he went to the door and said, who is that? He said, open the door, please. All right, he opened the door. You know what? A lady was standing at the door. He looked at her, stranger, why are you here? She just pushed the door open and pulled him into the room, onto the bed. And just as she was dragging him right onto the bed, horror of horrors, he found our brother's son lying on the bed. Quickly she left. Thank God he brought his son along. It has happened before. Sometimes you're just dragged in like this. You're not planning, not scheming anything. And then when you're trying to assume the fight and resist, another man walked in and said, you are trying to molest this woman who is my wife. You see, all these kind of things, they will take place like this, isn't it? And they're so critically important for all of us. I'm jumping ahead of time, let me move on, therefore. You see, Joseph's adversity, in spite of the fact that here is Joseph standing firm and steadfast, sadly what happens is that in standing firm and steadfast in doing that which is right, it landed him the trouble. And this is what we read of verses 6 to 10, like this. Let's read together. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had, referring to Potiphar. With Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and after a while his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. 
but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not consume himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Not only not wanting to go to bed with her, even be with her. There are some men I have counseled because in the workplace, there's a kind of feelings developing, an increasing passion developing between this brother and the lady working in the office. I have to say to him, get yourself transferred out in another department so that you don't work with her anymore. And you cannot get yourself transferred. I say, resign for your own good, for your family's good. Here is what Joseph and this account reminds us. Refuse to go with her or even be with her. Friends, proximity, closeness to one another can result in feelings, can trigger off emotions in all of us. And that if we don't draw a careful boundary about it, we find that we can just increasingly enjoy each other's company. And then we begin to plan times together as much as possible. And before we realize it, we are seriously bound in a process like this, isn't it? And that's why, friends, this passage of scripture is so real, it's so honest that the Bible has its record down for all of us like this. And in Joseph's adversity, friends, we notice Mrs. Potiphar scheming. In what way was he scheming? Verses 11 and 12, let's read together. One day, he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. He, but he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Isn't it? Poor Joseph, thank God he has got strength, okay, to escape, to run away. Thank God his cloak wasn't so tight that he could not run away at all, isn't it? He ran away. Potiphar's scheme all the way. But more than that, you know what happens? Let's read on. You see, now Potiphar is at work trying to spin a story around it. Trying to falsely accuse Joseph like this. Verses 13 to 18. Let's read together. When she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her servant, household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She clapped his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she so told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. My goodness, what kind of woman is she? Isn't it? Spinning all kinds of stories. And as we know, friends, there are lots of spin doctors around, even here in Malaysia. Amen? So half the news you read mustn't believe lah. Amen, isn't it? All kinds of untruth have been spin around like crazy. And Mrs. Potiphar is an example like this, tragically, isn't it? And yet, you know what, friends? In spite of sometimes spin stories going around, there's yet some people who believe in the spin. Okay, and this is what we read off like this, verses 19 and the first part of verse 20. Let's read together. When his master heard the story his wife told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. You see, friends, all right, his master believed all that the wife said instead of checking out the full truth of the matter with Joseph, that whom he has trusted so much. Instead of checking with Joseph, friends, he believed all the spin that the wife has come up with and just threw Joseph in prison. And friends, the moral is this. Sometimes when we do right, it can get us into trouble. Hello? All right, rewind. Sometimes when we do right, it can get us into trouble. When we refuse to bribe, we refuse to cheat and lie, when we honestly tell the truth, 
it can get us into trouble, and sometimes sadly serious trouble. And friends, can I say, the Bible is honest about it. Here is a reminder to all of us, friends, when we do things that are right, it does not necessarily mean that it, things will be okay for us. It can mean problems and difficulties. And the amazing thing is this, friends, that when Joseph got himself into trouble, we find that at the end of it all, you and I must remind ourselves, God has not left us as much as God has not left Joseph. Isn't it? And this is what we read, this last passage of Scripture together, friends. Let's read. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Isn't it amazing, friends? And that's assurance that you and I, friends, must hold on to. That in whatever circumstances we may be in, friends, God is there with us and for us. Can a good amen for that? And that's the reason why, friends, for all of us, you and I must be assured that God will never leave us or forsake us. And this is the passage of Scripture for us, Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let's read this last passage together, together, church. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? See, friends, I believe in the heart and life of Joseph. He was willing to go through it. Oh, why? Because he knew God would be with him. God would be there to vindicate him. God would be there to affirm him, friends. And that's what you and I must have. That sometimes, you know, sadly, friends, when we do things that are right and it gets us into trouble, sometimes we say, God, where are you in all this? Can't you see it is unfair and unjust? Can't you see this is crazy? And sometimes, friends, the sad thing is this. We begin to blame God and become bitter with Him. Friends, doing right, as I said just now, does not necessarily mean that you will not get us in trouble. But friends, be assured, God will be there with us, for us, in us, and around us. Can a good amen for that? Trust Him. Why? Because carry on doing right, carry on doing good. God will break through eventually and to vindicate you, to prove who is right and who is wrong. So friends, doesn't matter if we go to prison lah. Hello, are you still there? Doesn't matter if you go to prison lah. By the way, I've been to prison before. I mean, voluntarily, I mean. <laughs> so there's a world of difference. <laughs> All right, going to prison voluntarily rather than un involuntarily, isn't it? Uh, all right, but friends, if we go to prison for right reasons we see here, for the sake of truth, justice, and righteousness, for the sake of integrity, for the sake of standing up for the Lord. Friends, Joseph sets the example for all of us, isn't it? And there in prison, God remembers Joseph. He has not forgotten him. And so sometimes, friends, in our life as we go through, we wonder, is God there with me for me? Has God forgotten me? Friends, God has not, can I say? He remembers whoever we are. In fact, this morning, as I said, I conducted a wedding. And then after that, we were ushered to this lovely hotel for reception over lunch. And just as I was standing waiting, all right, uh, for the reception, someone from the back shouted, Pastor Daniel. Turned around and looked. Very nicely dressed, hotel staff. I looked at him. I said, you're from DUMC, isn't it? He said, yeah, I said, yeah, okay, you recognize it. Of course, I recognize you. I even know your name. I said, I've not seen you in DUMC for a long time. He said, really? Yeah. I remember even praying for you before you went off to Switzerland for studies. And after you went to England to do further internship. And you're not since coming back, appeared in DUMC. God has not forgotten you. 
out of seven million people in a Klang Valley, God sent me to meet you here to remind you He has not forgotten you. He is telling you, come home, come to UMC. Pastor, I promise I will come tomorrow morning. Pray for him. God has blessed him, prospered him, working that fancy hotel. But friends, that's the kind of God we have, isn't it? Pastor, he said, I work very long hours, you know, working hotel line, very long hours, very hard, very demanding. I hardly have weekends off. But Pastor, tomorrow I am off. Ah, God purposely sent me 24 hours ahead of time to remind you he has not forgotten you and you are important. Can you good amen for that? Say to your neighbor, you are equally important. Hey, say with greater conviction. You seem like saying with no conviction at all, isn't it? Why? Because every one of us is important. I said, well, can I hear a good amen for that? He is sovereign. He has not forgotten Joseph. And poor young Joseph had to go through that kind of adversity in life. It must be hard and painful. And Joseph stuck in there, trusted God, doing that which is right. God honored him in the process. Many great stories will come as you go through the book of Genesis from now onwards about the life of Joseph. Let us pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to say to some of us here, maybe you're here because of an invitation of a friend or relative, or maybe you just wandered in here, or, bec- or maybe you came here because you found out through our website this place, or maybe through a friend or someone else you heard about this place and so you came, or maybe some of you you're just watching on live stream right now. Somehow you lock in. Or maybe you've locked in regularly. I want to appreciate you. But I want to say to those who are here and those on live stream, God knows He has not forgotten you. You are precious in His sight. And if you do not know Him as Lord and Saviour, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour, today, He wants to step into your life and make the difference. Today, He wants to turn your life around and give you a hope and a future because God says to all of us, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and never to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of God that He's saying to all of us this evening. That's the kind of God He's saying to you right now watching a live stream, my friend. He, you are precious. Every one of us is precious. But also, my friend, this evening, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I want to extend the invitation to you with heads bowed and eyes closed. Never taken a step of faith to trust in Christ. You don't have a personal relationship with Him. And therefore, you don't know Jesus. You're not a child of God. My friend, God loves you. You are special and precious. That in God's goodness, He wants to step into life and this evening make the difference. And so therefore, if you like this evening to open a heart to invite Jesus into your life as Lord and Saviour with heads bowed and eyes closed, after us at a count of three, would you lift up your hand? I want to pray for you. At a count of three, this evening I say yes to Jesus, which is basically acknowledging that you're a sinner because all of us have sinned, the Bible says, and we've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. But secondly, to believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. Only the Son of God, the one without sin, through His death on the cross, can forgive me of my sins. Thirdly, to ask Him to forgive me, and then fourthly, invite Him into my life as Lord and Saviour. So that when you take that step of faith and pray that prayer, my friend, you become a child of God. You become a son or a daughter of the living God. And what an amazing privilege. And from then onwards, from today onwards, you begin to have amazing walk with Jesus all the way to the end. So if you've never done so, you'd like to do it this evening, whether you are here in this auditorium or you're watching this live stream, at the count of three, wherever you are, could you lift up your hand? Lift up your hand, and I'm going to pray for you. Are you ready? One, two, and three. Is anyone? Okay. Lift up your hand. Hi. Can I see your hand? I want to pray for you. Is anyone? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? 
Anybody else? Right in front. Anybody else? Keep your hands high. Would you can I see your hands? I want to pray for you. Right at the end, over that side. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Over two hands over there. Anyone else downstairs here first? Is there anybody else? All right. Okay. Upstairs. Is there anyone? Lift your hand high. Would you? I want to pray for. Is there anyone here? You are precious before God. He is sovereign. He has not forgotten you. Whoever you are, you may feel yourself insignificant. Maybe no use whatsoever. I want to say to you, God says you are precious. You are special in His eyes. Anyone else? For those who put up their hands, would you say after me this prayer? Or say, repeat after me with you. And church, would you join in to encourage these people? Put up hands. Say after me, would you? Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for your love for me. Lord Jesus, I want to say that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on a cross for my sins. Please forgive me of my sins. And right now, I invite you to come into my life, to be my Lord and my Saviour. Take control of my life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and your power and help me to live as a Christian, as a child of yours from today onwards. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Father, I pray you seal this in the hearts and lives of those who pray this prayer sincerely, whether their hands are up or not. Oh God, I pray. Lord, you know it all because you're an all-knowing God. So come and seal it deep, Father, I pray, and bring to pass your wonderful purpose and design. Oh God, I pray for these, our new brothers and sisters. Enrich them in a wonderful way, Father, I pray. Empower them to live for you and even those, oh God, praying with us on a, oh God, on live streaming, on the internet, Father. You will bless this one, oh God, richly as well, Father, I pray. And they're, oh God, Life in Christ will be an amazing right for these precious ones, O oh God, on live stream, Father, I pray. Thank you and praise you for all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen, amen. Shall we stand to sing this closing song? And those who put up their hands, will you come right to the front, okay? Ashes, can you help them walk to the front over that side, right at the end as the last row? Bring them to the front, friends. We as a family here, we're here to help one another. All right, we're here to embarrass one, we're here to help one another. But friends, as these people come, Will you give it a big hand as yes, 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 we give these people come? Yes, give it a big hand, will you? But also, friends, can I say, some of us, we are facing temptations, temptations to compromise. You come, we're going to pray for you, friends. Temptation, friends, to bribe, Tem- pressure upon you to compromise, pressure upon you sometimes to cheat, to lie, pressure upon you, friends, to change figures to fiddle with figures to fiddle with accounts pressure upon you that if you don't do you may lose your job all right that you're sometimes pressured to fiddle with accounts change the figures you come when i pray for you some of you friends you are tempted sometimes to compromise in a relationship that you know friends that in that relationship it is not right would you come when i pray for you we're going to pray for breakthrough. And some of you, you want to say, Lord, guard and protect me. I want to walk pure and clean before you. Sometimes there's a pressure upon you to want to compromise. You come, we're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for God's power. Some of you, friends, you want to say, Lord, help me, help me. I need to stop that friendship, that relationship, uh, that business dealings. Will you come, we're going to pray for you. Whether upstairs, downstairs, whatever it may be. It is irrespective, friends, of age. Young people, senior people, old people, friends, have muddled up their friendships and relationships. You come, we're going to pray for you. Sometimes in the business, in the work, whatever it may be, friends. And some of you, you want to say, Lord, help me guard my life. I want to walk pure. I want to walk clean. I want to walk right. I want to commit it to a life of purity and holiness. You come as well as but young people. We're going to pray for you. That God will protect you. That God will enable you to stand firm and steadfast and be faithful to Him. And so church, will you come upstairs, come as well, gallery, come downstairs, staircase, we're going to pray for you. So as the worship team leads us, friends, will you come, just as many, keep on coming with you, we're going to pray for you. Thank you, Lord. Say, friends, will you come? Come and receive the grace of God. Friends, come and take a stand. Take a stand against, friends, whatever that is not right. Friends, Ask God for strength. Ask God for enabling and empowering for you to remain faithful to God. Friends, will you come in to pray for you? We're going to pray that God's grace and strength will be there with you. Maybe some of us, friends, we need to really put things right. We need to confess and repent. Will you come in to pray for you likewise? Friends, 
there is no shame whatsoever, church. No shame whatsoever to put ourselves right with it. It requires courage and great courage, friends. Come, church, we're gonna pray for you. want to make one last call just one last call just sense that there's at least one person here you are wrestling with feelings in your heart and that feeling is increasing growing in you and you find it so hard to tackle so hard to deal with and that feeling, if it's not handled well, can trip you over and result in a bad fallout. Will you come in to pray for you? That increasing, growing feeling that you're finding hard. My friend, I want to say God's grace is here to help you. And the wisdom, likewise, to draw boundaries. And God is saying to some of us, if not many of us, just commit yourself to a life of holiness and purity. Begin to draw boundaries, young or old. God wants to minister and help you. And so this evening you say, Lord, I want to commit my life to one whereby I will seek to honor you, that I want your presence, that I want to be conscious of your presence, that I want to honor you, oh God, help me. Will you come? We're going to pray for you as the worship leads us in the last round. Will you come? Just as many. We're going to pray for you, friends. Just come, will you? Thank you, Lord. Church, will you come? We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for grace. We're going to pray for empowering. We're going to pray for breakthrough. We're going to pray for change and transformation. As I close in prayer, some of us, you can still come up for prayer if you like to. As I close in prayer, church, can I ask you to lift up our hands together? I want to lead us in prayer to make a mutual commitment together, a commitment to holiness and purity, a commitment to walk right before God, a commitment to remind ourselves that God's presence is with us all the time, that we continue to be conscious of God's presence so that we not do things that will dishonor and displease Him and bring grief to his heart and worship to break his heart. So with the lift of our hands, I want to lead us together, not just for you, for myself as well, to walk a life of holiness and purity. Would you do? Let's do so. Father, oh God, I come before you. I bring these, my brothers and sisters, and not just for these, my brothers and myself, oh God, as we stand before you with hands upraised. Father, I pray you help us all together, oh God, to commit ourselves to a life of holiness and purity. I pray, Father, you guard all our hearts, Lord. Guard our hearts from temptation and compromise. Lord, renew our minds, O God, so we'll think after right thoughts, O God. So that, Father, we give ourselves to do that which is right. Give us wisdom, Father, I pray, O God, and courage to make firm and clear decisions, O God. Help us, Father, I pray, together to draw boundaries in our lives, in our relationship so that we will know, Father, how to relate to one another in an honourable manner, in a respectable manner and a respectful manner, Father, I pray, so that we will not take advantage of God, whoever it may be, Father, whoever these people may be, 
whether people of the same sex or opposite sex. Oh God, I pray. Help us together, Father, I ask, Lord, to commit ourselves to righteous and holy living, to conduct ourselves with dignity and respect, oh God, to honour people the way they all should be honoured, oh God, from whatever, oh God, Father, I pray, Lord God, uh, ethnic or background, including sexual background, Father, I pray. And help us, Father, us together, Lord Jesus, oh God, to walk a life in total submission to you. Guard our hearts, oh God, I pray, Father, from temptation and compromise. Give us clarity of mind like that of Joseph, Father, I pray, to take a stand, to know that sometimes, Father, in certain situations that we will say to ourselves, likewise, how can I do such a thing and sin against God? Father, guard our hearts and protect us by your grace and your power. It is not in our strength, oh God, we can do it, but it is by your strength and your power. And so, Father, I pray today, you will fill each and every one of us by your Holy Spirit, empower us, enable us, oh God, to be firm and steadfast, oh God, to be faithful to you all the way to the end. And for those of us, Father, who are married, oh God, to be committed to our spouse, Father, I pray, all the way to the end. To be faithful, oh God, I pray, Father, to be open, to be transparent, to be truthful all the time in our relationships, Father, I pray, so that we begin to walk right, walk, Oh God, please me for you So that Father, I pray Together for all of us here in GMC We will be people of respect and dignity Oh God, I pray So that we will honour you and glorify your name So protect us by your power, Father, I pray Fill us with the Holy Spirit, oh God And give us real wisdom To make good and wise decisions, oh God To know what to walk away from And walk out from, Father And to know, oh God The right things to embrace, oh God, I pray, Father So that together, oh God We will build lives, build homes and families And relationships that will really honour you They will bring, oh God, much joy and pleasure to your heart When that takes place, Father, I know That we are going to enjoy your blessing And your prosperity, Father, I pray So bless us all, Father, I ask, oh God In our journey of faith in the walking together they were committed oh god to a faithful obedient oh god father i pray righteous living before you oh god i ask our father thank you lord and now the lord bless you and keep you the lord may his face will shine upon you and to be gracious towards you the lord turn his face towards you and give you his perfect peace through jesus christ our lord and all god's people say amen amen would you give a wonderful clap offering to jesus thank you lord thank you lord Again, church, those who need prayer, you come, we to pray for you. Otherwise, God bless you. Have a great day, a great evening, and a great week ahead. We'll see you next weekend.